Well, I don't know why I'm here, because I'm not a member of the media, and I'm not an expert on any subject. But uh, the organizers have very kindly given me permission to speak generally and, uh, you know, say what I have to say on uh, the past, present, and future of Indian democracy and its institutions. I have been a, an observer of the political scene for many years, and I've written political commentary over the years. And so I agreed to come. And I agreed to come because the institutions of Indian democracy have never been under attack as they are now. So these are my own reflections on what is going on. Of our two experiences of death blows to democracy, the one that we are now going through has a much more complex agenda than the earlier one. We had an emergency in 1975, which was very clearly a dictatorship. The opposition was in jail. The press was censored. Committed judges and civil servants were in demand and complete silence was imposed on the land. And of course, the Constitution was amended to deprive us of our right to life and liberty. Today, we have a situation where diversity and opposition to the ruling ideology are under ferocious attack. As for the human cost, citizens are being arrested on bogus charges. Others have been publicly tortured and killed. Mass slaughters have gone unremarked. And it's a time of grief and fear and suffering for many Indians. Those who are now branded outsiders and they do not feel safe living and worshiping as they have a right to do. But all this is happening in the framework of democracy. Another significant difference between 1975 and 2018 is that today's declared agenda of shrinking India into a religious and exclusively Hindu identity, that's the difference. Our 1975 experience of dictatorship didn't meddle with the secular, multi-religious, multicultural character and tradition of India. Today's Tana Shahi is more daring in scope and intention. It also has more power than any state has ever had in the past because it is equipped with advanced technologies of control that can keep an entire nation under surveillance. So I can see why Amit Shah has announced that his party will remain in power for 50 years. It certainly is equipped with the means to do so. But actually, I'm rather impressed with Amit Shah's moderation. Hitler, who was of a, of a similar mindset, and he is the model and admired icon for our ruling ideology, he announced that his Third Reich would last for a thousand years. 
So 50 years, of course, is much less. Well, changes do take place in thinking. You know, uh, it's quite natural that in the course of events, changes should take place. But today's world is as fundamentally different in outlook from 1975 as saying that from being round, it has become flat. And there are many aspects to this change. But for our purpose, I'm looking at the political aspect. In 1975, democracy was considered the way to go. It was considered the most civilized form of government. Dictatorship was condemnable. But in today's political climate, worldwide, this can no longer be taken for granted. In Spain, there is a nostalgia for Franco and fascism. Franco's rule, which set up a reign of terror and ordered the deaths of hundreds of thousands of his countrymen, is now seen as a golden period that brought stability and better living standards. Germany is coping with a militant revival of its Nazi past. The Nazi swastika and the Hitler salute are much in evidence in part of the country, as are attacks on migrants. And elsewhere in the world, I mean, leaders like Erdogan, Netanyahu, and Trump, who believe in the male fist, have been elected to power. So we're living in a world whose political mindset and values are far removed from 1975. Now, Today, there is an obsession with a unity based on a particular identity. There is a harking back to a past of so-called racial and cultural purity and other such fantasies. There is anger and hostility toward the other. And violence and savagery have become acceptable in pursuing these goals. This is the perfect political climate for the ruling ideology in India to find support. The, fa the fact that it too has been elected to power is one more example of the changes worldwide. There are, of course, Indian reasons for this also. And changes of government are usual and healthy. But at no other time could such a sea change have taken place in Indian politics. And in fact, it never could and never did until now. It was an ideology that had tried and failed to find acceptance with the majority of the Indian people since its inception in 1926. And it has only now, after nearly 100 years, found acceptance. And it has taken 62 years to get elected to power. I'm not counting an interregnum in between, for which I believe that there were other possible reasons. And this is the major difference between then and now, between our two, what I would call, dictatorships. But to get back to the comparison between our two shocks to democracy, the first one, as I said, did not affect our secular status. The present regime 
having rejected secularism and a multicultural identity, must not only establish its new identity, but it must ensure its permanence. So, the key institutions built up since independence, whether they concern history, science, information, education, or culture, must be taken over and men and women of the right ideological mindset must be put in charge who will turn these institutions into the required ideological direction. Well, this has been efficiently and rapidly accomplished. The speed with which the independence and integrity of universities has been challenged. School textbooks have been drastically altered with no regard for facts. And museums and academies have been taken control of. And the scientific temper of mind has been sought to be replaced by myths and legends is truly impressive. Well, those who have been entrusted with rewriting or wiping out a country's past history, and this has happened in dictatorships all over the world, are chosen for their loyalty to the ruling ideology. But they are not what we would call intellectual giants. If I were to invent a dialogue between an Indian historian today and a rewriter of Indian history, this is how it would go. The historian says, Akbar won the battle of Haldighati, but in this book, you are saying that he lost it. How come? The rewriter replies, he, he lost it because I say so. Well, once you have demolished the entire Mughal Empire, as some textbooks have done now, it is no big problem to demolish our achievements since independence. And to say nothing happened until today. And more colorfully, to paint Nehru as a monster and Gandhi as a miserable weakling. These two men are not going to figure in India's future history. Besides that, artists and writers are feeling the heat. I'm one of them. Five famous writers have been shot for rejecting superstition in favor of reason and for their independent views. Others are being intimidated and warned. The questioning mind, the creative imagination, and freedom of expression have no place in a totalitarian setup. Take the case of a young poet in Stalin's Russia. His interrogator says to him, do you call this a poem? It has made no material contribution to the Soviet state. Who says you're a poet? And he throws Brodsky into jail. Years later, Brodsky wins the Nobel Prize for Literature. So this is the kind of sheer ignorance about art and literature which is in action here. It is threatening and terrorizing artists and writers. So much for our past and present experiences of the submersion of democracy. 
does Indian democracy have a future? Can we roll back the tide and recover the freedoms guaranteed us by our Constitution? As we once did. We did this the first time round by invisible collective action. The most dramatic election we had ever known brought the dictatorship down in a crushing defeat in 1977. But the situation today is not so clearly defined given the, re the revival of the popularity of fascism and doc doctrines of the same kind and the trend that there's nothing sacred about democracy. I've been interested in what a philosophy professor at Yale, his name is Dr. Jason Stanley, has had to say about how propaganda works to make an ideology such as fascism or any other similar doctrine acceptable to people. For it to succeed, specific steps have to be taken. The majority community has to be made to feel that it is being threatened by minority groups. And this indoctrination has to take place by an all-out appeal to the emotions so that it builds up into a kind of general hysteria against the minorities, or as happened in Germany against the Jews, who are then seen as enemies of the state and any action against them, even extreme brutality, becomes acceptable. The state then has to be protected against these enemies and against all dangerous influences like socialism or communism. Also, conspiracy theories have to be built up because the national temper has to be kept on the boil. And all this groundwork is what creates the atmosphere where liberty is no longer a value and liberalism is despised. Authority takes its place. The leader and the military are glorified. Well, this Yale professor was not writing about India but the resemblance to what is happening here is uncanny. In a democracy, the military stays out of politics and out of the public eye, and war is not celebrated, and the leader is not held in awe. He is held accountable. He has to face the press, he has to face parliament, he has to answer questions. He is lampooned and cartooned. And in the absence of all this, a democracy is in deep trouble as we are today. And hence this conclave. When members of the public join in committing acts of violence against the minorities, it is clear that the groundwork of indoctrination has achieved a high degree of success. Tista Settelvad has given the example of two Gujarati housewives who pushed a Muslim off the balcony of his second floor home in Ahmedabad. And he fell down to a bloody death this casual murder was simply carrying out the message that Muslims were not welcome in a Hindu part of the city and that they should confine themselves to living in ghettos. And this act 
took place during the violence that was triggered by Mr. Advani's uh, Rath Yatra, which of course was a sign of things to come. The two, these two lady murderers were congratulated during the Navratris of 1991. And the lynchings and killings that we are now seeing are similarly being committed by loyalists who believe in the rightness of what they are doing. And they too have been congratulated for their crimes. In our transformed atmosphere of changed values, these are not crimes. And those who commit them are not criminals. And all this is happening within the framework of democracy. Can sober facts compete with the techniques of emotional arousal? Well, individual and collective voices have been raised against all these assaults on freedom. The question is that if things have gone so far that crimes have been openly committed in the presence of the public and the police, despite the existence of a democratic framework, what does this tell us about the ground level work of indoctrination and how successful its techniques have been in transforming human values? in bringing out the worst in human nature, in fact, and making acceptable what was never acceptable before. Well, so far, India has been an exception to world trends. India stood apart from the Cold War. India refused to accept allegiance to either side. India put democracy before development and established universal suffrage at the very start of nationhood. No other country had done this. And no, nowhere else did universal suffrage give women the vote as a matter of right and equal citizenship from the very beginning of nationhood. India has repeatedly shown that it is not afraid to be different, and it has followed its own wisdom. I'm reminded of a few lines of, of a poem by Robert Frost, where he says, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Can we maintain this historic difference? If the agenda for a religious identity and inclusiveness succeeds, it will destroy the bravest and most remarkable achievement in democracy the world has ever seen. One of the great tragedies of today's transformed atmosphere has been the transformation of Hinduism into Hindutva, which is a militant creed that tolerates no viewpoint but its own. In the recent outreach by the chief of the RSS, we are asked to believe that it is moderating its stand. But if a Hindu Rashtra remains at the center of its agenda and Islam is still considered an outsider to India, where lies the change? In 1939, Hitler promised Chamberlain peace in our time. The next day, or soon after, he marched into Poland, Belgium, Holland, France, Denmark, and Norway. 
So I confess I'm a skeptic. And my question remains, can facts compete with orchestrated emotional arousal? And when terror becomes official, as it has become in Uttar Pradesh, where shall we go for justice? The future of Indian democracy depends on answers to questions such as these. Thank you.